Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Renwick Gallery. I'm glad you all made it out tonight. I think we were expecting rain. We weren't sure that we would get such a fantastic crowd, um, but I think great artists can sometimes bring that out. Um, so uh, tonight is the last program that we're actually having uh, associated with the Wonder Show. It's kind of a sad day that all of this is about to come down, but uh, in about a week, we're going to reopen the permanent collection. It's going to be fantastic to see. I hope you all come back for that. Um, in the meantime, um, I am delighted tonight to have with me Gabriel Daw. Uh, Gabriel is the artist who created uh, Plexus A1, otherwise known as the Rainbow Room downstairs. <laughs> um, I think that piece is probably one of the real favorites from this exhibition. It's really blown people away. I know it's blown me away. Um, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about Gabriel. We're going to have a very um, informal conversation here, probably talk for about 40 minutes, and then we'll invite audience, audience questions. Um, and Gabriel, you're set up with some slides if you want to talk a little bit about some of those along the way. So yeah. a little bit about Gabriel while we get the rest of our setup going here. Uh, our guest this evening is Gabriel Daw. Gabriel is originally from Mexico City, and his work centers on textiles, often examining complicated construction of gender and identity in his native Mexico. He's been featured in several publications, including Sculpture Magazine, on the cover of the 12th edition of Art Fundamentals, published by McGraw-Hill. That's a pretty cool feature. Um, and Tristan Manco's book, Raw Plus Material Equals Art, and his work has been exhibited across North America and in Europe. He earned his MFA from the University of Texas at Dallas, and he is currently living and working in Dallas. So we're extremely excited to welcome Gabriel. Um, and are you, are you on now, Gabriel? All right, I may just pass the mic to you then if that works out for you. Okay. Gabriel, I thought we would just start out a little bit. I know that uh, some of your work, very much of your work, seems to stem from early years and your boyhood experiences in Mexico. So I thought it'd be nice to start at the beginning. Sure. Uh, so my uncle Brad uh, degree was in science. I uh, loved it. Loved it. And until the day came, I didn't. And um, I had a burnout, and I decided that's it, I'm going to become an artist. And <laughs> very naively, I, I quit my job, and I thought I was going to be able to make a living off of it right off the bat. And um, I spent that first, that I, I spent one year without working, and uh, I started doing experiments with collage, paint, um, and sort of trying to find my way. And uh, I had a few shows, but um, it, it, after, a, well, after a year, I had to go back to work and uh, come to re grips with reality that I had to find um, a job and uh, it would take longer. And um, so after a couple of years of doing painting and collage, I had this recollection of a childhood frustration, and um, that was that my grandmother would teach my sister how to embroider. Uh, I, and <laughs> she, um, she would, so she would teach my sister how to embroider, but she wouldn't teach me because I was a boy. And uh, my mom sort of was the black sheep of her family, so she was very liberal in a way, but because she worked, uh, we spent a lot of time with my grandmother. And so my mom's family was pretty conservative. Um, and, uh, you know, girls are in the kitchen and boys uh, don't cry and they don't sew and they don't embroider. Um, and so I recall that, that, that frustration as a child because I really wanted and I remember stealing thread <laughs> 
and trying to do my own thing uh, when I was a kid. And, uh, and then I guess I grew out of it. But uh, when I was sort of in my late 20s, I decided to teach myself how to embroider. And that's how it all started. Uh, the very first thing I did was, I don't have an image, unfortunately. Um, it's in storage in Montreal, and I haven't been able to get it. But it's, um, it's a piece that kind of looks like a mandala, but it's supposed to be a pornographic image. And it was this sort of rebellious act against my upbringing. Um, I did not. <laughs> I did not, however, she did see later work of, later of my embroidery work, uh, at least images. I don't know if she ever saw it in, pers in person. So what do you think it was that drew you to embroidery? Um, I guess the, uh, the meditative quality to it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't really know how to answer that, actually. Uh, what do you think it was as a child that you thought was was it the, the prohibition of it? Probably, partly it was that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there was something about the process that really captivated me. Interesting. Um, just the, uh, the, the detail-oriented type of activity that um, ends up in this hole that's composed of very tiny little bits. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I think, it, uh, most, I think mostly it was a process. Okay. Um, I thought you could share some of your early work with the audience, yeah. but I also know that you have one of the pieces here um, that seems to have a relationship with one of the other artists that was right. in Wonder, uh, Jennifer Angus. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, this was the Fear series, which in a sense, is kind of the culmination of the embroidery work. And when I was in, I was living in Montreal, um, I had decided to become an artist. And I went to Toronto and I saw Je uh, Jennifer's show at the Textile Museum. Uh, and it was, I mean, it was a really big show. Uh, it was probably like if she had done the whole upstairs here. Um, and it really blew me away. Um, it, I, I think at the time I was started, I, I was starting to do embroidery uh, already, uh, and seen doing collage, but um, it kind of really changed my perspective of what art could be. Um, so yeah, I was really stoked to actually meet her and. So you were starting out doing collage and painting and that kind of work, and then you started to move into the embroidery pieces. And then you started to move into more three-dimensional works, like the piece that you have on the screen, or the next slide up that you have on the screen. Yeah. Um, so I went to grad school, and in grad school I started experimenting with, um, with uh, 3D work. and. I think one of the tasks um, that a specific course was, uh, it, it was about sculpture and um, translating what I was doing but into sculpture. Um, at the time, I was a little obsessed with uh, Gunther Ecker, uh, from the Group Zero, um, German group from the 60s. And um, it somehow, uh, thinking about that translation between 2D embroidery into 3D uh, and inspired by that uh, Gunther's work, uh, or Hecker's work rather, <laughs> um, it just inspired me to do sort of these uh, pieces called the Pain series. Um, and it's all straight pins uh, through pieces of clothing. Um, and that work is sort of all about how we have to deal with pain uh, as, as part of life and how sometimes uh, we self-inflict that pain. And uh, 
sometimes it's through incisive thoughts and uh, and we wear the pain. So that's what this work is about, uh, for the most part. Uh, then later, uh, it kind of got uh, mixed with uh, still in grad school, uh, sort of doing some sort of activist work. Uh, it started to get combined with the um, uh, this idea of don't ask, don't tell. Like at the time, there was the debate was full on about whether to repeal don't ask and tell or not. And so I did a series of work that uh, really deals with ideas of uh, fear um, about gay uh, military members uh, and also the idea of taking away the functionality out of something that's perfectly functioning, functional. Uh, and uh, so you have like this pair of boots that are perfectly functional, but they're, they have this intervention that uh, takes away that functionality just because of a social construct uh, and a, f a fear, sort of a xenophobic fear about uh, gay people. Uh, so I'm sort of fast forwarding ahead a little bit to ask this question, but uh, in your early work with the embroidery, you were talking about uh, remembering those moments that you were not allowed as a child to be uh, embroidering because you were a boy, and then you have this work that's also dealing with gender issues. Do you feel yes. like that's something that's still consistent in your work? It seems like some of the earlier works were a little bit more angry, social, <laughs> and we've <laughs> come to this beautiful, happy place, so. Um, I think it is in a very subtle way, just because I'm still using the same material. So I think it's still there, it's not, I think it's resolved. Um, yeah, for sure, like I saw uh, the embroidery work as this stance against that um, gender specificity um, about, um, you know, kind of, rebelling against that upbringing and just sort of challenging it. And uh, when it moved into the Don't As Don't Tell pieces, it kind of went from the personal to the social, I guess. And uh, it, 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 uh, it just, uh, I guess it was a way of translating my personal struggle with my own identity to uh, uh, a more universal aspect surrounding that. Um, this is also from uh, the Don't As Don't Tell pieces, and uh, this is sort of when I started using thread in a different way than just embroidery, and uh, here it's sort of representing that uh, social construct wrapped around somebody's identity uh, and taking away, again, the, the functionality um, of a perfectly functioning pair of boots. So how did you translate the work that you were doing then into that next level? What was the, the catalyst that um, began larger installation work? So because all the work I was doing was very small in scale, like I think that the biggest piece was uh, this one. The, uh, it's called intolerance, and um, which it was actually, it, it took like 320 hours or something like that, uh, and it weighs about 30 pounds. And uh, and so this was sort of the biggest scale, and it, 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 that I was working on. And although I, I mean, I say that, but this actually is after I started the installation, this particular piece, uh, but. I had this really desire of uh, making something big uh, for a couple of years, and it kind of everything came together when, uh, as part of my uh, artist residency, that was part of my MFA program, uh, I was uh, asked to collaborate with an architect, um, and the show was about links between fashion and architecture. And so 
doing the research for that show is when I started uh, coming to this idea of an architectural structure with the core material of clothing. And that's how it started. And it was just a really big experiment. At the beginning, I was um, at the studio at the residency, and I had this big wall. And I was like, well, what would happen if I just string this? And I think this is a video. I don't know if it's going to play, but let's see. Yeah. Well, this is supposed to be a video. <laughs> Um, but anyway, um, I would go up and down that ladder 300 times a day. How long did that first piece take? Gosh, um, it took, I think, all condensed. It was like if I had worked for five weeks in a row, like daily, it was five weeks. Um, it was done over a period of, I think, three months. Wow. And then that series. Yeah. Was that piece called Plexus? Was that part yeah, of it? Yeah, so that, this was the first piece and mm -hmm. uh, it became Plexus number one. Um, when titling work, I'm, I don't, it, it's always a struggle to find the right name for me. It's, uh, so I decided uh, to find one name and serialize the work. And I decided to name this work Plexus because uh, Plexus is a, a network of vessels in the body or nerve endings. And these pieces are very much so like a network of, uh, of thread. And it, uh, I, I thought it fed, fit really well. And it was sort of like a little bit of Latinized thing going on and uh, so I settled on Plexus and this is Plexus number one um, and it w I mean it was just a big experiment I didn't really know what I was doing um, I like, like my partner was really scared I was going to fall off the ladder <laughs> so um, he was really concerned um, but yeah uh, I think it really paid off it was really satisfying and uh, if you haven't noticed like uh, most of my work is very obsessive in nature and uh, you know that I was literally just going up and down with a single strand of thread uh, and it uh, yeah I think it, it, I mean it really paid off <laughs> <laughs> certainly got a lot of attention that's for sure um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the process of making these. I know that when people come into the gallery and see these pieces, the first thing that they see, of course, is these incredible colors. A lot of people ask uh, whether the strings are colored or whether that's a, a lighting effect or how those work. A lot of people want to know what that, um, what that entails. So. Is there, you know, if there is there a way I can? It's a video. Is there a way I can make it play? No. Anyway, the. Um, uh, There's uh, the gallery that now represents me in Dallas. Uh, they have Conduit Gallery. They have a, a project room. And uh, the person who curates that, that room, she saw my installation in, in my studio. And the, she saw the collaboration with the architect. And uh, so she gave me a show uh, in the project room. And uh, the only issue was that I only had one week to install um, and I mean this piece was kind of slightly bigger than the one I did in my studio so I was like oh sure I can do it <laughs> um, and 
I had to come very fast. And you know, it was gonna be like in nine months or something like that. And then she called me and was like, how about next month? we had a cancellation. So I was like, sure. Um, Mother of invention, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, I had to be... Streamline. Right, and I had to make it, uh, I had to come up with something to, to speed up the installation process. So, uh, yeah, I'm very proud of my ingenuity. <laughs> um, I, develop this tool that kind of works like a giant needle. Um, so I just, in a space like that piece, um, I just stand on the floor and uh, just take the thread to the ceiling with this extension pole. And um, that's, uh, I mean, really fast. It's really fast. Uh, I think you worked with an assistant here for this Yeah, um, so. I think, um, I mean, one of the, the things that um, I'm really happy about is that now I'm able to pick and choose the, the, the projects I take on, and uh, they're sort of becoming more and more, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, oh, what's the word? Um, they're ambitious. Um, so, like a space like here, uh, downstairs, um, I had to work with two people, um, and I had to, I have to work with lifts, um, and sometimes I have to work with two lifts, um, and uh, so yeah, and working with uh, another person, uh, it fasts. Sorry, but um, it, it, it speeds up the, the process. So actually, tell me about the, the exhibition here. Mm -hmm. um, how did Nicholas contact you? What was the first indication about this show? Uh, I got an email from Nicholas, and I was like, the Renwick at the Smithsonian? Like, <laughs> really? <laughs> um, I, I was really excited. Um, and I, I knew it was not, um, I mean, the way I was approached was like exploratory, was not a done deal, but it was really exciting. Um, I later found out who the people I, got, I, I was going to be showing with, and that was even more exciting to me. Um, and uh, he asked me to do a proposal. He, he asked me to come. I did a side visit. He asked me to pick up a room, whichever I wanted. So I picked up one, and he was like, well, that room is taken, so you have to... <laughs> so, it's always a process when you're putting together an yeah, exhibition. Yeah, um, But... Um, so he gave me that, the room downstairs, which was kind of like the, the room I was avoiding. Which, what's, <laughs> what's interesting is, of course, we knew that was the room that you were avoiding. Um, but <laughs> in this gallery, there are such quirky rooms, and there were only a few artists that we thought could actually fill those rooms. That back gallery downstairs that had Patrick Doherty, and it was a massive space, and we thought that was the right gallery. And we gently suggested to Patrick that he take that one. And we gently suggested. <laughs> Gabriel was so kind to us that he yeah. said yes, but um, essentially, in the end, I think that gallery really collaborates with your work. Oh, your work is perfect yeah. for it. And it's, it's interesting that it was the gallery that you didn't want. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it definitely paid off. And I guess I was avoiding it because it was a little bit of a challenge. And, um, you know, I think, I mean, I think in the end, it was just a little bit daunting. So. Uh, but, you know, I think uh, I'm glad that Nicholas pushed for that, that room. Because uh, also, I think, like, the way that piece you know, works with the columns, mm -hmm. um, I think it's just really good. It's beautiful. Yeah. You seem to be very up for a challenge. You're will <laughs> able to get it done in a week if it needs to be a week, able to get it done between the columns. I think you Try also have a couple of images, and I'd love for you to share the images of 
a couple of the other spaces and how the work. I wonder if you talk a little bit about how the work plays yeah. with the architecture and how you decide upon uh, the shape of the work and the collaboration there. Um, so this was the, ver the, the third piece I did. And it, it kind of was, it, it became like a domino effect. So the first piece gave me the second show. The second show gave me this show. And this is a nonprofit space in Dallas that has closed. Um, over, it's now closed. Um, but uh, this is the first piece where I consciously decided that I was going to use the full spectrum. Um, the first pieces, I was working with bright colors and the gradients, and um, it's the, the full spectrum is not quite there. Um, but because I was uh, creating these very ethereal uh, structures that were reminiscent of light. Um, I decided to make that con connect. Uh, I decided to make that connection consciously and uh, more with an intention. And um, I was a little bit scared of doing it uh, at the beginning because I thought it was gonna take away from the work. I was. I thought it was gonna make it a little bit shallow in a way. Um, but I think, in the end, the opposite is what happened. It just gave the work more depth. Uh, and it just sort of, you know, it just, um, how did it? Uh, well, it did, struggling it, for the it word, did but feel like it completed the work. The shape right. of the work has this prismatic kind right. of effect. It felt, it just felt right for Exactly, that piece. exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, and then this was the fourth piece I did, which was also in Dallas, uh, the Dallas Contemporary, and they had just moved into this massive warehouse. It was very raw when they asked me to do this piece, and um, the good thing is that I really had a long time to install. I think this took me like three weeks, and it was a very ambitious project. I was still in grad school, so I was going back and forth between school and installing. And um, I really, so I think this piece also key in how I work now uh, in terms of creating volumes in space. And um, my original idea was going to be more like the first piece I did, which is uh, more flat and more about um, like a curved plane. Uh, but very last minute, I decided to reverse the process, and it gave me volume instead of a plane. And it just, another part of the puzzle just came together. And uh, it, it, it really, um, it, it was really a key piece uh, in, in, in the series of work. And it was really cool, too, because you could actually walk through it. Um, and I haven't been able to do something like this since, um, not necessarily because of um, a lack of desire, but because you know every piece is created for the space it's going to be in, and not all. Um, I don't know. It hasn't really come up like that again. So um, yeah, I think that's one of the things I really like about work is that every new project is a new opportunity to try something new. It's always a dialogue uh, between me, the work, and the space, and uh, sort of what the space is asking of me uh, in terms of what I can create in, in it. Um, so I'm interested in talking a little bit further about that. and. Um, one of the things that I found was really interesting in Nicholas's book when he started to discuss what all of you artists that were involved in the project had in common, he decided to call you the new materialists, was the little <laughs> token that he used. 
And I'm curious to know, I think, a little bit about how you feel you fit in with the other artists that were in this show. And also, the second part of that question is, I know you and I discussed, um, your work has this very interesting relationship to, for instance, the California Light and Space Movement, artists like James Terrell. It's almost that movement in reverse, where mm -hmm. you're, uh, you're making the material immaterial. So how your work fits into the sort of larger trajectory of art and craft as well. God, Big question. That's a lot of question. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure how, how to answer that. It, it, I, um, I do see the relationship with the art and space, uh, the light and space movement. Uh, and like you said, I think I'm coming from the opposite direction. Like they're coming from the direction of light, sort of trying to in a way materialize light mm -hmm. and I'm doing the opposite and sort of with material I'm kind of trying to create light mm -hmm. um, in a somewhat artificial way. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know, I, you know, I, I mean, I'm struggling because it, the light, the light and space people, artists, are so canonic. And it's been mentioned before that there's a relationship there with my work. And to me, it's a little bit like intimidating. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I don't know, I, it, it, it just to ponder that uh, affiliation. Um, it's a little bit mind blowing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't know. <laughs> So a couple of people have also already mentioned tonight um, how much they love the piece that's in the gallery, mm -hmm. how much they're going to miss it when it's gone. Yes. Um, it brings up a really interesting point to your work, the yeah. question of, of time and the relationship of the ephemerality of the work to the piece. And you deal with that a little bit, um, John Grady dealt with it, as yeah. did uh, Patrick Doherty. And I'm, these works typically, you can tell them about what happens to these works when they come down, but... Um, it, well, I think it becomes some sort of meditation on life and death. Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, there's very few pieces I've been sad of them coming down. Um, and for the most part, are pieces that I've had more uh, of a relationship in terms of time, like the one in my studio was really hard to take down. Um, it, it, I, you know, it, it, it's always been a part, it's part of the work and uh, they come down and they become what I call a relic. Um, and they kind of become the opposite, they become dense instead of ethereal and they become organic instead of geometric. Mm -hmm. um, so it's that metaphor for you know life and life after death or life and death yeah um, i i think we'll see photos of those relics um i think later right yes. um, yeah and i mean and there's permanent pieces as well so i think uh the work can you know, live longer, uh, which is nice, and uh -huh. I have a few of those, and um, hopefully I'll have more, mm -hmm. but, uh, <laughs> and, well, you know, I, I think they, it, it has its own beauty when they come down, it's just that it, it, 
the draping of it. Like some, sometimes I display those relics as just a cascade of color. Mm -hmm. uh, it really, it, 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 it has its own beauty. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it's what it is. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, we have just a couple of minutes left. If you'd like to show a couple of the relics and a couple of the other yeah. pieces, I think that'd be wonderful. This, uh, this piece you can still see if you go to Provo, Utah at the BYU Museum of Art. It will be there until the end of the year. Um, and it's pretty dramatic in terms of <laughs> sort of light flushing. Um, this piece was at Virginia Mocha and that was in 2014. For some reason, 2014 was the year of the circle, and I did a lot of curves that year. And I, that's also one of the things I like about doing these. Like, there's been an evolution to the work, and um, certain themes emerge. Mm -hmm. um, and. Right now, what I'm starting to get into is that deconstruction of the spectrum. So that's going to start appearing at sort of the end of the year. Uh, so we have to follow me on Facebook so you so. can see it. <laughs> or, what are your upcoming projects? Um, right now, I'm, I'm in the middle of an installation at the Amarillo Museum of Art, mm -hmm. which I'm really excited because um, it's, um, sorry. Amarillo Museum of Art in Amarillo, Texas. And speaking of the light and uh, space uh, artist, um, it's, a, it's, it's a show, it's called Side by Side, and it's a two-man show with uh, Larry Bell. So um, that's very exciting. This piece um, was one of those pieces that when I conceptualized this and, and I, uh, I was working on it, I wasn't expecting much of it. <laughs> I thought the space was gonna compete mm -hmm. with the work. Uh, and it was really such a nice surprise that it just integrated with the space uh, so nicely and it really, um, they played off of each other really well. Um, this piece is, uh, was in Italy, in Como, and this was one of those instances where I was really sad that it had to come down. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And then, you know. And then ours. Yeah. That seems like perfect place to stop then okay. and ask some audience questions. So. Um, any questions from the audience? I think I can probably take this out. Yeah. Uh, this is just a practical question. Where do you get the string? Uh, where do you get the equipment? How do you get it brought in? I mean, this it just it's a you know <laughs> it's an architectural it's a mechanical it's a mechanical wizardry. Um, so they're all installed on site. So the thread comes in a box, you know, this big. Um, they're in spools. And when I first started doing this work, I would just get it at the craft store, like just the biggest spools I could find. Um, and then I started our relationship with the company. Um, I use uh, Gutterman Thread, and they, at the beginning, they really supported me. Um, and I use their industrial line now, uh, which is slightly thicker and it's it's less fuzzy, so it's more. Yeah. It's polyester. Yeah. Next question. Hi. Um, thank you, first of all. And so my question is, um, in your earlier works, 
you started off with like the boots, for example. You started off with the boots with the nails on the inside mm -hmm. as a confined and a constrained sort of um, form of identity. And then I don't know if it was chronological, but you moved on to the boots with the, the colorful rainbow strings wrapped mm -hmm. on the outside. Did that reflect a shift in your perspective or a shift in identity or an acceptance of sorts of others or yourself? Um, I'm trying to think if they were, which one was first. I think, I think they were somewhat simultaneous. Um, and for sure, the one with paints took longer to put together. Um, but I don't think, um, yeah, I don't think there was, in terms of the boots, I don't think there's a relationship of, I think that whole project, um, and it was not necessarily coming to terms with my identity. I think it was, um, I think I had done that already. I was just trying to find universal aspects of that identity. Universal connections. Yeah. Could you do one? Is each installation a one time deal, or have you ever thought of actually reinstalling it? Is it possible to reinstall it? Or does everything come apart? Uh, it kind of depends. Um, for the most part, when they're temporary shows, it's just a one time thing. Uh, it's happened. Um, like the piece, of, uh, I did a piece for Crystal Bridges for a show, and it was acquired by the museum. So um, that piece, if for certain circumstances, like another show, they have to take it down. Um, there's an agreement that I'll come again and redo it. Uh, so it, it really, I guess, it's case by case. Um, the other permanent pieces I've done are for corporate commissions for the most part, so they just stay up. First of all, thank you so much for speaking with us and your work is really incredible. Um, I had a question in terms of your process and, visual and visualization. Um, have you found now that you have made it so many pieces like this? Um, that you're able to get a sense of how it will look with the light and the transparency, how the colors will interact. Um, do you test it? Do you find yourself surprised by the outcome? Um, um, so for several years, I didn't have a studio, so I didn't really get to test anything. Uh, so each piece was really, and it still is, like each piece I'm trying to push what I do and try to find new things to, uh, or try to explore new ways within the work. Um, there's, for the most part, there's always something new in each installation um, that surprises me and that's sort of what keeps it interesting to me. Uh, and I, you know, it doesn't bore me because I'm, uh, you know, there's always little things I can change to get a different effect or, uh, you know, explore in different ways. And uh, now I do have a studio and I do get to test things out, which is, n it, it's nice. Um, and, uh, but yeah. I don't know if that, that answer fully. Thank you very much. Uh, my question follows on. I'm looking, pretending this wasn't here and envisioning you standing there. And I guess I was wondering, how do you feel or sense the environment that you're going to create in? And now that you have a studio, do you make mini mock-ups of your rooms so yeah. that you could you know, put, you know, as you say, test. Yeah, yeah I, I don't really do mock-ups. I've done, I think I've done two mock-ups. Um, I, 
when I try things now in the studio for the most part are either variations on um, what I'm envisioning for a specific piece or just trying an idea out, um, trying a material out. Um, it, uh, I've shied away of making mock-ups because uh, I think, I mean, I think what, and that follows up that previous question, it, it, I really like that sur surprise. If I do a mock-up, it kind of takes away of the possible surprise in the space. Um, well, I do. Uh, I did show them a drawing. Yeah, I did have to do a proposal, <laughs> and I. I mean, I always do because uh, it's you know it like this is what I want to do, and they get excited, and uh, it, it's a way of. Uh, you know, getting the ball rolling in terms of, and that's sort of how it works. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello, thank Hi. you to you and to the Renwick Gallery for this wonderful talk today. I noticed that you talked a lot about how your piece interacts with the architecture and how you conceptualize it uniquely to the place that you're working in. However, one of the major things I noticed about your work downstairs was how the viewer interacts with it. People love to walk around and look at where the strings go and no matter where you're standing, the light changes and the shape changes. So I was wondering if you could talk about when you're conceptualizing the piece, does the viewer come into account of what you're going to do? Do you think about how the viewer will walk around the space and how they will look at it? Um, I think mostly there's a pragmatic uh, thinking in terms of how people are going to uh, access the space and uh, sort of move around the space. Um, there's, I, th I think part of it is also just a given of what the work is. And it's not so much intentional, but it's just what the work is. Um, there is this sort of thinking uh, of how you know, people kind of have to dance with the piece. Um, and I do think that that is some sort of um, parallel as to how we navigate life itself and how we have to uh, navigate social constructs. And in that way, I think the work connects with that earlier work about uh, social constructs. Um, because we're in a constant dance with these constructs and we don't even notice. It, it, it's very natural to us. Uh, but um, and, uh, there's this quality also about the work that's very, it's almost like kinetic. Mm -hmm. And uh, without it moving, it, it, it's like kinetic work. And uh, that really captivates the eye. And uh, I think that's what people really enjoy interacting with that aspect of the work. First of all, just thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but I was just struck by your, the creativity, you know, to do this sort of thing. And, and yet, it strikes me as awfully boring. To <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, these little things and, I, and your movie down there, I could see you going up and down, and you yeah. talked about that before, but that's kind of a, is that somehow balances out and, and <laughs> you know, meets your needs? <laughs> um, 
It's funny. So I think there's, um, I've noticed some sort of pattern with all installations where there's an uphill battle the first few days. Um, and, you know, you get into a rhythm. So it's not boring. It's not, I, I don't think it's ever boring. It's just, it can be a little tedious at times. Um, and, but I think, well, I don't, I don't necessarily find it tedious, but it just uh, physically is tiring. And, you know, at the beginning of an installation, it just kind of like, it feels like uphill. Because every installation, it's kind of like learning new, uh, a new choreography. And, uh, because I have to make different movements. And so as muscle memory starts building up, uh, and uh, the body starts getting used to it, we sort of reach a plateau. But uh, for the, I mean, we get into a rhythm that's very zen. Uh, if there's one person that needs to be counting, so it's very, you have to be focused. Um, if I'm working on a piece on my own, I have to be counting on my mind. Um, and, you know, it's, it's meditative, me meditative for me. And, you know, like right now I'm installing in Amarillo and we're working, we're three people working at the same time and um, it's a very tall piece. So I'm on, up on a lift, taking the thread to the ceiling and then I have someone on the ground sort of catching the thread and taking it to the ground and then I have a third person actually hooking it on the floor. And the third person who is not part of my team, he's mentioned that like I could do this forever. It's just really, you know, it, I've, I've been said a lot that it, 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 it's like fishing, like fly fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so yeah, I think, and you know, I, I've also been told people watching the process, telling me like, you know, it's like, it's hypnotic. It, it just, oops, it's, you know, there's a lot of back and forth and very sort of slow motion. Uh, so, mm -hmm. but, and this and, is, I'm sorry. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of my work is very obsessive. So I think there is that that quality to it for Back sure. To that first slide. Mm -hmm. This is our last question. Uh, you touched on the uh, idea of kinetic sculpture. Have you studied any of the kinetic artists from the 60s and sort of what inspired them to create things? Have you had a whole element of color that very few of them ever did? And so I'm just intrigued to see if you would than the art history behind you or could it come on your own? Um, yeah, for sure, I think there's a big influence from, um, you know, Soto and uh, Cruz Diaz, for sure. Um, I also, I think of art is a big influence as well. Um, but I also think that Artists like, well, especially Anish Kapoor, uh, who I think is like a master of capturing the immaterial uh, that, um, you know, have really inspired me. Um, I'm sure if that answered the question, but <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. We will have a book signing. There are books for sale right here. Um, and just at the corner of the Grand Salon, the lights will come up in just a second. And Gabriel will be very happy to sign them for you at this table. Once again, thank you, Gabriel and Nora. Thank you all.